what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about changes, shifting supply and demand curves in response to particular changes in other variables. All right, how does this work? First of all, terminology. I use the term, this is kind of a technical term used in economics, not often used in principles textbooks, but I'm throwing it out there because it's the right term. It's called comparative statics. And a comparative statics exercise is we have a particular equilibrium situation or condition described by the intersection of supply and demand right here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to change one of the variables that is influencing supply and demand here. And then we're going to see how that affects the other variables in the model. Now, I've, I've used this term, and I haven't highlighted this in the slides. I should have at some point. But I'll make the distinction now explicitly. I want to talk about the distinction between what's called an exogenous variable from a variable called an endogenous variable. Now, an exogenous variable is a variable well, it's a variable like the price of a substitute good in this particular case. Its price is determined outside of this particular market, all right? And the participants in this market observe that particular price, and it affects their decisions in this particular market. But they don't have any influence over that price. And so it's a, a variable whose value is determined outside of the model itself. And it has to be given to the participants in order for them to make their appropriate decisions. Okay, we can then change exogenous variables, values. We can raise the price of substitutes or lower the price of substitutes. And we can ask, how does the change in that exogenous variable affect the marketplace? Well, when we do that, we're saying, how does the change in exogenous variables affect the endogenous variables in the model? Now, the endogenous are the ones that are determined. That is, they are determined as outcomes of the model. They are the implications of the model. You know, so again, going back to our original discuss discussion of models, there are sets of assumptions, and these assumptions lead to implications. The exogenous variables are like the things we are assuming and plugging in as assumptions to the models. And we can change those assumptions a little bit. We can change the values of those variables and then see how it affects the implications of the model and the implications are going to be the endogenous variables. So in particular, in this model here, the most important endogenous variables are the price of the product and the quantity of the product determined at the intersection of supply and demand. What price and what quantity comes about are the implications or the endogenous variables being determined as a result of what the exogenous or input variables are to the model. All right, most of the assumptions most of the values go back to this graph here. All of these variables over here are exogenous. These variables here are exogenous. All right, and a comparative statics exercise is asking the following question. What if we change one of the exogenous variables? Suppose we change one of the exogenous variables, C dot P dot. Ceteris paribus. And ceteris paribus means we're going to leave the value of all the other exogenous variables fixed at their original positions, their, their original values. So we're going to change the, the, the value of one exogenous variable, leaving all the other exogenous variables fixed. And we're going to ask, how does that affect the endogenous variables, in particular, the price of the product and the quantity of the product? All right, and that's the comparative statics exercise. So let's do it. One last thing though, a comparative statics exercise is like an experiment because now what we've done is we have built up a simple economy. We've got a functioning economy described with the supply and demand curve functions that have all those assumptions built into them already. And now we're gonna do an experiment. We're gonna say, let's change one of the exogenous variables and let's see what the model predicts would happen to the endogenous variables, the price and quantity. All right, let's do it. So first question, let's suppose the price of a substitute good rises. So if we're talking about coffee, for example, in this particular market, then the price of a substitute would be something like the price of tea or maybe the price of uh, juice that you would buy at a juice store instead of going to the coffee shop instead. You know, anything that you would 
purchase instead of sometimes the coffee that you're purchasing would be a, a substitute good. Now, going back, remember that the price of a substitute good is right here. It's affecting the demand curve in the, in the marketplace. And the price of substitutes does not show up here where we're looking at the effects on the supply function of the market. So price of substitute goods are only going to affect consumer decisions, really, not producer decisions. How do we do that? Well, the increase in the price of substitutes, remember, it's positively related to demand. And so the effect of that is going to be to cause the demand curve to shift to the right, to something like D prime. All right, now, as it shifts to the right, the equilibrium is going to shift. But before we get to that, when demand shifts upward because of the increase in the price of substitutes at the original price in the marketplace, we're going to end up with demand being out here at Q2, while supply at the price P1 is only going to be at Q1. So the initial effect of the increase in the price of substitute and an increase in demand for this particular product is going to be to cause excess demand to occur in the marketplace. All right, now that's going to generate a price too low adjustment process. The price is too low for equilibrium. The auctioneer or the retailer is going to recognize excess demand and the, the reduction in inventories that are taking place, and they're going to respond by raising up the price in the marketplace. That should continue until we get to the new equilibrium. Instead of at point A, it's now going to be at point B. And as a result of the movement to the new equilibrium at point B, I could mark out the new prices and quantities that would have to prevail. The price that arises in the marketplace is going to go up because of the extra demand for the product, and the amounts sold in the marketplace is going to go up. So notice that the change in the price of substitutes does affect supply, but it affects supply through a change in the price in the marketplace which then inspires all of the firms to increase their supply because they're getting a higher price of the product. No shift in supply takes place, but there is an effect upon supply that works its way through the effects in the marketplace itself. All right, and that's all we have to do. Look at the variable change, figure out which direction one of the curves is gonna shift, and then tell the story about how the price or quantity is gonna be affected as a result of that particular change. So. Price of a substitute good goes up, we expect the price of coffee to rise and the quantity of coffee sold in the marketplace to go up as well. Next story. Let's do it again. Next story. Suppose that average household income in the community purchasing coffee decreases. Okay, now when I talk about income effects, you have to remember, go back to this slide, Income is right here. Household income is an effect on demand, not an effect upon the supply functions itself. So all of the effects are going to take place on the demand side. Now you're also given information here that the good is normal. And that's going to tell you that the income effect has got a then positive relationship upon the, upon the demand for the individual product. Okay? So normal good, positive relationship. But remember, we got a decrease in income taking place. So the decrease in income may be coming about because of a recession or because of a COVID pandemic that's shutting down an economy is going to reduce household income. As a result of that, being that coffee we're presuming is a normal good, it's going to cause the demand curve to shift to the left to something like D prime here. Okay, and as it shifts to the left initially, again, next bullet point here at P1, we're going to end up with demand at the quantity Q2, while supply initially is going to remain at the quantity Q1. So we're going to end up with a price too high adjustment story to tell. All right, well, when the price is too high, the auctioneer or the retailer, recognizing that there's excess supply and a decumulation of inventories, inventories are disappearing, they're going to respond by lowering the price and expanding the amount of trades that take place in the marketplace. Oh, there's another reason why an intermediary like a retailer wants to adjust the price downward in this particular direction. Remember that the intermediary is making a transactions cost. Or I'm sorry, they're making a, a fee, I should say, on each transaction that they make. So basically, they're charging the merchants, the, the, the producers of this good, 
they're getting a little bit of the surplus coming from both producers and consumers as a result of their intermediary role. As a result of that, they want to expand the number of trades that take place as much as possible. They want to get as much, they want to move as much product as possible. Okay, because the more they move, the more they're gonna they're gonna make money. Right? And in this particular case, if the price is too high and the supply is out here, but the demand is just not enough, they're not moving the product. They're not selling it. They're only selling as much as Q2. They can get increased sales by lowering the price of the product and increasing the quantity sold out to here instead. Okay, increasing it from where it would be if the price remained at P1, I should say. Okay, they could get increased demand and they're gonna get reduced supply but they're gonna get more trades taking place because they've shifted to this particular new equilibrium. And that's motivating the retailer to adjust the price downward to its own advantage. Okay, final effect though. Decrease in household income, reduces demand for coffee. The total impact is gonna be a drop in the price of coffee moving from point A to point B, and a decrease in the quantity of coffee sold in the marketplace. So lower, Lower incomes, reduced demand, and redu reduction in demand lowers both the price and the quantity that ultimately is going to be sold in the marketplace. All right, another story. Let's talk about a change on the supply side. Okay, now we're going to talk about changes in worker wages. And in particular, I should be talking about coffee worker wages, if that's the product in question here on the right-hand side. So we're going to imagine that there's a change in wages that's going to workers in the industry. And when we talk about wages, and I should make this distinction formal here, we talk about wage changes, we're thinking about it in the context of the supply and what it costs you to supply a particular good. When we talk about income, we're thinking of it in terms of the money that consumers have already received in their work and now are thinking about spending it for goods and services. Okay, so income affects demand, wages affect the, the supply decisions. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this is because it's really easy to kind of get confused and to think that, well, wages are going up, so therefore people's incomes are going up too, and therefore there's gonna be effect upon the demand in this particular market. The reason why not, the technical reason is really that we're imagining that coffee is just a small market in the total scheme of things. And that the consumers of market are, are much more than just the coffee producers themselves. So if coffee worker wages go up, yeah, coffee workers do make money and they do spend it on coffee, but they're too small of an influence in the market for coffee overall. The demand for coffee is really coming mostly from people who don't produce coffee. They're not producers of coffee themselves. So when worker wages go up in the coffee industry, it doesn't necessarily mean that income in aggregate is going up, affecting the demand for coffee. And that's how we're gonna treat it here. So wages affect the supply decisions, income affects the demand decisions. Now what happens? Suppose worker wages in this industry rise. Again, CP means ceteris paribus, nothing else is changing at the same time. Now, the effect of an increase in worker wages is that input prices are gonna go up. That's gonna raise the cost of production, shift the marginal cost of the firms upward, and supply is gonna shift upward or to the left, to something like this, S prime. Initially, at the price of P1, and before any initial adjustment takes place, we're gonna end up with supply at Q2 here, but demand is momentarily gonna remain at Q1. So we're gonna end up with a situation where the price is too low and that's gonna inspire the auctioneer or the retailer to respond to this disequilibrium and raise up the price. Okay, ultimately, we're gonna move from point A to point B in the market equilibrium. We expect tendencies will push the market in that particular direction and as a result, the equilibrium price of the product is gonna get pushed upward while the equilibrium quantity of the product starting at A is gonna get pushed downward. Okay, so price rises, quantity falls, and that's the effect on the endogenous variables from a change in one of the exogenous variables in the market. 
All right, now, you can do that exercise with any of these changes. Change any of these. We'll always do it one at a time. Well, we'll almost do it always one at a time. Occasionally, I'll throw in a curveball and basically say, let's let two of these change at the same time. How would that affect the final result? And when that happens, a lot of times the final result will be indeterminate because you're not sure how big these size, the effects of these changes are going to be. And some of them might affect price upward and some of them might affect price downward. And so if you've got both of them changing at the same time, you could be having offsetting effects on prices and quantities. And that could make the total result ambiguous unless you knew the actual values or numbers of these things and had a numeric model of this, which we're not going to do. Okay, so this opens up a whole world of possibilities in terms of questions that could be asked in terms of adjustments to an equilibrium in response to changes in the exogenous variables. And so you should be able to do any and all of them. One last thing I'm going to do, I got three minutes, so let me do this real quick. Supply and demand long run effects. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail about this next time. Suppose the initial equilibrium here, price P1Q1, is a long-run equilibrium and profits are equal to zero at this particular equilibrium. Remember that if that's true, the long-run supply curve is going to look like this. It's going to be a horizontal line at the equilibrium. And that's going to be the, the price that minimizes average cost of the uh, a representative firm in the particular industry. Okay, now we could ask, what's the long run effect going to be from, say, the price of a complement good rising in price? Okay, now the price of a complement is negatively related to demand, right? And so that means if the price of a complement good goes up, the demand curve is going to shift to the left in this particular direction to D prime. Okay, so D shifts left, show it on the graph, I've just done it. And as a result, we're going to end up with pressure for the price to come down in the marketplace. Price comes down in the short run to this new price, P2, as we move from an equilibrium at point A to point B. But this is a short run adjustment. And as a result of the prices getting pushed down to, to a price P2, that's actually going to generate losses to the individual firms in the marketplace. All right, those losses eventually are going to lead to exit of firms by in the industry, and the exit of firms is going to start to cause the supply curve to shift back to the left. That shift is going to continue the number of firms, I should say this way, NS goes down. As a result of NS going down, the price is going to get pushed back up, and our final equilibrium is going to be at point C on the graph. All right, and that means that the long run effect of a change in the price of a complement after you allow entry and exit in response to changes in profits is actually going to be a movement from A to C. That means the quantity is going to fall, but the price is going to stay exactly the same as it was originally. Okay, so the long run price stays the same. This is a little bit more complicated, of course, and we're going to come back and talk a little bit more details of this in the next class.